this is the first study that I've seen that quantifies the impact of the cost shift for underpayment for Medicare and Medicaid. What they concluded was that the average commercial premium is inflated by 10.7% because Medicare and Medicaid don't pay what it costs to take care of their patients. And that's before you take into account the 17% that are uninsured. So, yeah, we're all for job creation, but how do you pay for it? And then how do you reconcile this nearly billion-dollar swing here in the state of Georgia from Medicaid? You know, we're getting $700-plus million, or roughly $700 million for Medicaid, and the provider's being cut by uh, $400 million, $425 million a year. That makes absolutely no sense. So... You know, the macro environment economically is not positive, and physicians are in the same situation. GHA is part of a group called Access Healthcare Coalition, which is made up of the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the County Commissioner Association, uh, most of the primary care physician specialty groups, GHA, the Nursing Home Association, the Pharmacy Association, and they are, we are going in lockstep down to the legislature saying, you've got to cover the cost of Medicaid or we're all going to go down. You know, and I hate to be dramatic, I hate to be gloomy, but that's the reality. I mean, if you owned a road construction company and the state came to you and says, you know what, you're a road construction company in Georgia, we need to repave 75 from Chattanooga down to Florida, and we want you to do it. In fact, you have to do it because you're located here in the state, and we'll even pay you 84% of what you spend. <laughs> you got the picture? That's, that is the situation we are in with Medicaid in the state of Georgia. Well, and, Glenn, there was actually a, a American Hospital Association study recently that showed uh, estimates or forecasts for 2010, 2009 and 2010 of 40% cuts in human capital across hospitals throughout yeah. the United States and 65% reduction in investment expenditures in technology. Yep. So that's in and of itself counterintuitive or, or counterproductive to what Right. Uh, it, it, the assumptions are in this in this package that the right. twenty billion dollars. So again, we love the stimulus. We're all for IT and all that stuff. But you know, if if you're the CEO of a hospital, if you're a small physician, you don't know how to pay your bills tomorrow. That's probably you know it, it could have a positive effect because maybe people get so desperate that they hope that you know eventually this stuff will pay off, and that you know it's not a bad thing. But you know, physicians. Just one last statistic: physicians to help my access healthcare friends. Physicians in Georgia are currently paid 70% of what Medicare pays. The Medicaid side pays 70% of what Medicare pays. So in other words, Medicare is kind of okay for physicians. Take 70% of that, and that's what you get from Medicaid. So these guys are desperate. I mean, all the provider community is saying, we don't know how long we're going to be here unless something changes. It can't go on forever. Indeed, that's what uh, Kirk Wilson, the CEO of St. Joseph, said at our January event. He gave the keynote and basically said hospitals manage on average 10 weeks of, of, uh, of cash in terms of cash flow and, and survival. Other than that, their bond ratings are being cut, and, yep. and, uh, and, and, and it's survival. Well, let one. me – one more statistic. I was at a hearing on Friday with the Senate and House Joint Appropriations Subcommittee. The CEO of a, of a Georgia hospital, I won't identify, it's part of the public record, but I won't identify it, but they said we have one day of cash on hand, one day of cash on hand. Just to pick up on that, I, those are staggering um, statistics, and that's, that is tremendous pressure on the system. And, and I, you know, if you sit, think of the flip side of those numbers, the, um, it's being borne by the private insurers and the self-employed, so, or self-insured. So IBM is self-insured. We're making up for, if you will, the subsidy to those folks. Now, I guess at a, at a, at a macro level up, our health system, we're still spending dramatically more on our health system and getting poor results. I don't know if the folks in this audience are familiar familiar with the statistic that we rank 37th among countries in the world in the quality that we get out of our health system in terms of mortality, life expectancy. That's staggering. You spoke to the medical errors, people who are dying as a result of prescriptions, people dying in hospitals. It's really, we really have to get the system to operate more productive on our behalf. And in the context of IT, I think IT is way too expensive and not sufficiently productive for, for hospitals. Physicians aren't buying it because there's not enough value in it. And so the role that one of the important pieces of the, uh, 
of the stimulus is around standards. And standards are going to be absolutely fundamental towards enabling the systems to work well together. So if you, one of the things we talk about, if you go digital with information, so we talk about a, a, a paper intensive industry, just making it digital doesn't let the systems talk to each other. And the systems really aren't talking to each other right now. The standards are going to be an important part of allowing that, allowing the, the actual system to work together. That will also allow costs to go dramatically down and much greater value. So we see a lot of pressure on ourselves, too, in terms of being able to deliver value into this industry. I hope this is an opportunity to move in that direction. I, I, we, we do a lot of observa observing of doctors in the exam room. On average, when a physician walks out of a, an exam room, they only generate four sheets of paper, charge ticket, note, prescription, order. At the point of care, they don't need a lot of data to, to perform their services. Yet the industry, if you walk into any medical practice, it is inundated with paper. And the compliance requirements re calls for that. It forces their hand to, to keep track of all this stuff, and, and it layers cost on top of cost on top of cost. So that, I think the real struggle here is... How do we uh, remove a lot of those barriers? Uh, you were talking about the cut and paste. The OIG is after what's called a clone note. So doctors have a tool that helps them code better. They came back and said, wait a minute, that's a clone note. Now, there are some EMR systems that have been poorly designed to default in a way that does help that physician code better uh, and maybe even coaches the coding to, to some extent. But the insurance companies and the payers have been allowed to have very sophisticated technology that goes in and does what's called... Um, stealth down coding or silent PPOs where the system automatically decreases the reimbursement because it says you didn't check this box and it's the physician's responsibility to catch that and if they don't they're, and even if the insurance company's wrong there's no recourse so it's it's a hamster on a wheel kind of thing you're you're in this sort of you know until we can remove the bureaucracy and make it to where physicians can can actually uh, you know get compensated for doing the work it's it, it's a hard it's a hard uh, obstacle okay and I'm going to switch tenor a little bit because of the privacy, you know, the enhanced protections on the privacy side, which also are going to be costly. One of the, and I did, I used to work in genetics. I know sensitivity to, to information, and this was the, we have to enhance the penalties. We need to enhance the coverage. And there's a lot in that statute that is a little troubling, one of which is that if I go in and see my doctor, and I, let's say I'm at risk for breast cancer or Huntington's disease, and I say, Dr. Jones, see me today, let's do this exam, I'm going to pay you out of pocket. I'm going to pay for the whole thing. Don't turn the claim. So I'm going to tell you, and under the stimulus bill this is allowed, you cannot report that to the health plan, that information. Well, most physicians sign a contract that says you cannot do that. You can't take money from a patient if that patient is enrolled in a health plan. So. I, I, I hate to say the naysayers, but that's clearly a problem for physicians. Not, not to mention what happens when I later start to get symptoms. You think that insurance company is going to let that doctor participate because you didn't share the information? Are they going to pick up the cost when I end up in the hospital with breast cancer? I mean, there's a lot, you know, there's, and, and I know you guys have other issues to talk about with the privacy. I have a lot, obviously, more I could say, but that's just one. Yeah, privacy is probably one of the biggest barriers in terms of uh, the overall picture. I, uh, I saw an interesting article, and I'm about to open it up to audience Q&A, so, but I just want to throw this one last thing out there. Uh, article in Business Week I saw yesterday, but it was from this week, and uh, the idea that this, this whole initiative is going to create more headaches for the doctors than anything, than, than it will help, um, especially certainly in the time frame we're talking about. You know, maybe the, the light at the end of the tunnel is 10 years out or maybe five years out, but you know, one year, two years might be a little too ambitious. But uh, it, they were talking specifically about small doc practices, but it goes really across the board in terms of the, the gap or the missing pieces between the, uh, the money here that's coming down the pipe and the pie in the sky in result of things are better, saving lives, saving money, as Newt always says. Uh, but these missing pieces, things like uh, change management, interoperability, communications, uh, training, obviously. Uh, Jeffrey talked about the, the drastic, is a good analogy, the drastic change in mindset that's going to be required if you have to do all these different things, and that directly affects your compensation, obviously, not to mention the quality of care you provide, which are both not mutually exclusive. So I, I guess that was one of the, the problems I had uh, 
with hearing all this and a point made by the article, so what about those missing pieces and, and what are we going to do, not just for the small practices but across the board because uh, as we've already talked about, a lot of doctors are sitting there saying, okay, that's great, you're going to do this for me, but again, as, to Glenn's point, you know, I'm trying to survive, but also just it's, it's hard, it's challenging, it's a change of mindset. Change is never easy, um, and the way that electronic systems are, are, are being delivered currently are going to require physicians and others to change their whole workflow. Um, recent, a physician went to a, um, a concierge practice, and so for the privilege of $375 a month, I could see him whenever I wanted to. So I, I said, maybe I'll find another physician. And as a criteria of finding a new physician, I have one doc who was otherwise uh, connected. So uh, I went about my search to make sure that my doc would be, be prescribing and all of these other um, uh, issues. And I selected a physician. And when I walked in that, that office, there wasn't a clipboard, y'all. It was amazing. There wasn't a clipboard that I had to fill out. Um, and there was virtual no paper through the process. It, it, there was a printer off in the corner that if, you know, my pharmacy didn't accept e-prescribing that I could get a, a paper prescription. But by and large, it was seamless. I, w when I went into the exam room, there was a laptop. Did I feel uncomfortable? No. I, I walk into my office every morning and there's a laptop. We're all used to technology, but it's going to require physicians to change the way they fundamentally practice medicine. Just like when we all, and there's several of us that have enough gray hair to remember life before computers, right? The IBM Selectrics, you know, that are, that are now boat anchors. Um, but but we, we, all, we, all, we all had to change. Largely, medicine hasn't changed since 1966. The reimbursement system hasn't changed since 1966, which is a wonderful, 19th century solution. 19